but uh, the overall impact of these treatments have not been seen uh, in terms of lowering the disease burden, global disease burden of hepatitis C. Uh, that's not because they, these are not effective. These are very effective drugs, but still disease burden has not been significantly lowered in the last 10 years. There are several contributing factors. One of the uh, alarming contributing factor is uh, emerging resistance, drug resistance against almost every known drug now. Uh, and other factors, for example, uh, this infection is asymptomatic. When a person is infected, he doesn't know whether he is infected or not until very late stage of infection when liver is damaged and sometimes uh, treatment options uh, are not really, really effective. So due to the asymptomatic nature, especially in developing countries and, and, and underdeveloped countries, uh, the people, they do not have a culture of uh, uh, routine uh, medical examination, or physical examination. And since most of the people, they are unaware about their uh, infection status, they do not pursue treatment action. And this is actually uh, very alarming to know that in the last 10 years, uh, it has been estimated that uh, roughly 15% HCV infected people had been treated with these, these medicine, and most of those, they did not have assess, uh, they, they were unable to, to pursue the treatment options. So uh, that's why an effective vaccine is, uh, is necessary. Despite the availability of very effective treatments, medicines, this infection is still there. Uh, it's, it's disease burden, global disease burden has not significantly lowered despite 10 years of effective drugs uh, have been passed. So if effective vaccine is there, uh, then I think the vaccine can be administered at population level to tackle this, uh, this infection. Uh, uh, recently, actually, actually in 2016 and, and, and 17, uh, in collaboration with Punjab AIDS Control Program and Punjab uh, Health Department, we conducted a population-based study in 80 different uh, towns and cities of Punjab. Uh, and uh, found that uh, uh, there are there are around four districts where roughly 30 percent or over 30 percent population had exposure to this infection and most of those people did not know about whether they they, they, they had ever infected with that, with that hcv so those this map uh, this heat map, especially those districts which are colored dark red uh they 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 show that the population tested in, in that region, they had uh, exposure to virus because this was zero prevalence. So we, we tested the presence of uh, anti-HCV antibodies. Uh, so it showed that many people, they are infected and they are unaware of their infection status and they of course cannot pursue their treatment option. So when we talk about vaccine, why there is no vaccine against the, this, uh, the, this virus? The reason is uh, the conventional method of vaccine development, which based on sometimes uh, truncated virus or heat inactivated virus or recombinant surface protein based vaccine, uh, several vaccines have been developed and none of those have been successful. The reason behind is that the surface of the immunogenic surface, which is the cover of uh, the virus, is highly variable. So it, so the vaccine possibly, those vaccines can, can affect only in a strain-specific manner, but not to, to the diverse strains and diverse phenotypes of the virus. And because of that, uh, high variability of the, uh, of, the, of the surface, those vaccines have not been successful. 
But the alternate approach which currently people are pursuing is uh, rational vaccine design, rational structure-based vaccine design. The, the rational structure-based vaccine design means that uh, you get information from uh, the recognition of antibodies, uh, neutralizing antibodies, if they can recognize some uh, highly conserved regions of the virus. The surface overall is, is highly variable, but within the surface, within those, those enveloped proteins, there are some regions, uh, for example, receptor binding site. Those are highly, highly conserved. And if uh, you understand the recognition of a specific monoclonal antibody, if that monoclonal antibody is recognizing that highly conserved region, and if you know the structural feature of that highly conserved region, when it is bound by the antibody, then you can use those uh, structural feature to design a protein-based uh, uh, vaccine, and that would possibly be uh, the most effective vaccine or rational vaccine design. So this is just a cartoon presentation of, uh, of the virus and its replication cycle. So virus, hepatitis C virus, it basically recognizes uh, uh, different receptors present on the uh, liver cells. And uh, the recognition is in a stepwise manner. The most important receptor which has been well characterized is CD81. So there are different receptors where virus binds in in a stepwise manner, their structural basis of recognition, most of these receptor binding is still not known. However, uh, the well-characterized recognition of CD81 uh, is, is available. And after uh, this stepwise binding of different receptor virus enters in the, in the cell through uh, clathrin-mediated uh, endocytosis and then undergoes its, its, its replication to, uh, to form new virion which is released from the cell. So uh, the genome of the virus consists of uh, an RNA. This is an uh, RNA virus and it has a genome uh, which is translated uh, into a single polyprotein. Just one protein is uh, uh, is synthesized during its translation. And then that large polyprotein is cleaved into, into, uh, into different uh, small proteins, which consist of non-structural proteins, which are NS52 to NS5B. Most of these are different enzymes. For example, NS5B is RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. NS3 is uh, protease, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are structural proteins, which are enveloped proteins and the core proteins. Uh, the generally, uh, the most outer uh, surface uh, of the virus consists of E2 glycoprotein. It is glycoproteins, highly glycosylated. When we look at the more detail of this, this E2 protein, it consists of some very highly variable regions, which are the most exposed part of the protein. Uh, and then some of the very conserved region, which are highlighted in green. There are three highly conserved regions, which are generally involved in receptor recognition. And those trees represent different glycans and glycans and different amino acid uh, linked. Uh, actually, till uh, 2013, the structure of this, the most important proteins of the virus, because this is the enveloped protein which is present at the surface, uh, and that is the only aminogenic protein. The primary aminogenic protein or the vaccine target is primarily E2 enveloped protein, because this is the outermost protein at the surface and our immune system has direct access only to this protein, and only to the surface. Its structural features were unknown till 2023. And then in 2020, 2013 and 14, the first structure 
uh, of E2 was uh, solved by two different groups and published into very high impact factor journals, Nature and Science in, in, in parallel. According to the structure, uh, uh, it has a CD81 binding site and, uh, uh, and epitopes of different neutralizing antibodies. Uh, Two of the most effective uh, neutralizing antibodies, HCV1 and AP33, they recognize CD81 binding site as linear epitopes. And some of the antibodies, they recognize conformational epitopes. The difference between linear and conformational epitopes means when antibody recognizes just a continuous sequence of peptide, we say it's a linear epitope, despite it has certain structure or conformation. Uh, but when antibody requires uh, multiple peptides from different parts uh, which have come close uh, in its structural feature, then we say it's conformational epitope. So interestingly, uh, there are several antibodies which are HCV neutralizing antibodies, which are linear epitope specific antibodies. So as uh, we know uh, there are around 30% of uh, the HCV infected individuals who can uh, spontaneously resolve infection without any treatment. And how they can is still not very well established, but however, the role of antibodies in this spontaneous uh, clearance has been, uh, been well studied and established that antibodies do have role in spontaneous resolution. So uh, our hypothesis uh, towards uh, designing a structure-based vaccine uh, is that if we know uh, about those antibodies which are involved in the spontaneous clearance of, uh, of the virus, those monoclonal antibodies, and what is the epitope specificity of those uh, monoclonal antibodies, those, those neutralizing antibodies? What is the part, what is the epitope which they recognize? And then what is the structural feature of those uh, epitopes when those antibodies recognize? And if we know the structure feature of those epitopes, one can design those peptides in that particular structure as a vaccine. And that is basically the idea uh, behind this study that first we know uh, if there is a role of antibodies in the spontaneous clearance and if there there is then what are what is the epitope specificity and if we know the particular epitope which is potentially involved in the uh, in the uh, in the elicitation of those antibodies which could basically neutralize and, and contribute into the spontaneous clearance uh, then we can look for its, it's a structural feature uh, in antibody bound conformation and design uh, vaccine. So this is the first phase of this, uh, this study to understand the epitope specificity of antibodies potentially involved in spontaneous clearance. So as part of this study, uh, uh, in collaboration with the, uh, basically two, three different hospitals in, in Lahore, one is PK Alai and Shalamar Hospital and also uh, Punjab uh, Health Department, we were able to uh, identify uh, more than 50 individuals uh, who had uh, HCV infection and that had been cleared without any medication, spontaneous resolver. And in parallel, we also uh, uh, collected serum samples from chronic individuals, around 50, 60 chronic infected individuals. Uh, then uh, we looked at uh, the, the structural feature which were uh, actually reported in 2014 uh, and the data so far uh, has been reported about antibody epitope recognition. We, uh, we know that there are three highly conserved regions. We have uh, mentioned here, uh, this is the amino acid number of E2 protein 412 to 423, uh, which is pretty conserved in all seven genotypes with some kind of variability at a couple of positions. Same thing, this is another highly conserved region, which is 432 region, 
and the super conserved region, which is five to three regions. So all these three regions are involved in making constituting the CD81 uh, receptor binding site, especially this region, 523 region, which is just the base, the front of, 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 of the viral envelope where uh, CD81 receptor makes contact. So in this study, we uh, synthesize these three uh, peptides, which have the sequence corresponding to the conserved region of uh, three different epitopes. And then we uh, had collected around 100 uh, serum samples, 50 from spontaneous dissolvers and 50 from chronic patients. And the first step was to, to, to look at the reactivity of those serums, these, pept these peptides using ELISA. Uh, in this, uh, uh, this picture, I can maybe explain just a just little bit uh, so this is, the CP is chronic patient, SR is self-resolver. So when we look at uh, those uh, chronic patient, uh, see that we see there is quite a good response re reactivity. Uh, uh, for example, in case of in this peptide, uh, most of uh, uh, the chronic patients see that which were reactive against this uh, uh, mm -hmm were pr primarily uh, only this one. And then the reactivity against this peptide, this was uh, quite vigorous. In, in most of the patients we, we saw that they have reactivity against this one. And this 523 region is kind of special. There is hardly any antibody reported so far, uh, which is reactive to this uh, this particular highly conserved region. And we saw a couple of antibodies from chronic patients. They were really, really reactive against this, uh, this highly, highly conserved region, even at 100-fold dilution. Same thing, we, we had this, uh, this data for spontaneous resolvers. Uh, and the, uh, the message the information, actual information, which we, we obtained. I, I don't want to explain this, this data in more detail, but actual information which we obtained from this, uh, this analysis was uh, that when we look at a uh, uh, chronic patient, uh, around 70% of the CRA they were reactive to multiple epitopes. It means they have antibodies chronic patients either had antibodies, which are reactive to multiple epitopes, but only maybe 30% uh, CIRA were reactive to single epitope. They were less specific. Then contrary to this, uh, those spontaneous resolver, around 80% of uh, CIRA were reactive only to one of the three uh, epitopes and only maybe less than 20% were reactive to multiple epitopes. So it tells that in spontaneous resolver, antibodies are elicited, but they are not elicited. There are only less types of, uh, of antibodies. They are very specific. Antibodies elicited, that is elicited possibly only against one or two epitopes, uh, but only specific antibodies were present as compared to chronic patients where maybe different types of antibodies are present. So this was very preliminary information, the reactivity of those CIRA with those three epitopes, highly conserved epitopes. And most of the, the CIRA we collected, they had reactivity to one or multiple epitopes. And the information was uh, spontaneous resolver had uh, most of the spontaneous resolver have more specific response as compared to communication. Then move to the next stage, we will look whether uh, those antibodies, those are reactive, but whether they are really neutralizing the virus or not. So we, uh, in our lab at LEMS, we have very well-established system of uh, formation of pseudovirus. So we synthesize pseudovirus. Pseudovirus mean the virus, which is complete virus, but its genome is truncated. 
when genome is truncated, it means that it will infect once single round infectivity, but it will not produce, it will not replicate oh. because its genome is absent. So using this single round uh, infectivity assay uh, with the pseudo hepatitis C pseudo virus with its neutralization assay uh, of uh, samples, and this, this data is the ED50 effective dose of different dilutions, 50% uh, effective dose of the serum. Uh, so in chronic patients, what we observed is that most of those uh, uh, reactive chronic sera were uh, neutralizing, and some of those were really, really potent. For example, the ED50 was around like 5,000 times dilution. When it was diluted, like 5,000 times, it was 50% neutralizing. Uh, it means that some of those sera, uh, they Shazad, either have uh, your time many, is up. many different types we, uh, of antibodies. We have to move to the next speaker, titer. please. I'm honored and privileged to introduce the uh, uh, next invited lecture uh, of this session. And uh, Dr. Fa will be delivered by Dr. Farina Bilwani. Uh, she will talk about uh, natural killer cell mediated immunotherapy in acute uh, myeloid uh, leukemia from uh, bench to that site. Dr. Farina, uh, she is affiliated with the, the Department of Biological and Biomedical Sciences at Aachen Medical uh, University and Hospital, and uh, she has uh, started her professional career as a consultant uh, hematologist at Aachen, and uh, she also worked uh, with the SIUT. And uh, she has uh, uh, awarded her PhD degree from uh, uh, Loyola University, Chicago, USA. And uh, currently, she is focusing, uh, especially in bone marrow microenvironment and uh, B cell uh, lymphopoiesis. And she has uh, various national and international awards and uh, publications. Dr. Farina, we look forward to hear you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and um, thank you so much for your uh, kind introduction, and I'm really thankful to the uh, members of PSI for uh, giving me an opportunity to um, share my work. So um, uh, there are no conflicts of interest. So um, I think that we are all kind of uh, aware of the fact that, you know, the cellular immunotherapy is uh, uh, really an emerging field for the last couple of years. And you must be thinking as to why people are talking about using immunotherapy in patients with cancer. Well, number one, uh, we already know uh, from our basic uh, knowledge of immunology that uh, immune system is supposed to take care of our cancer cells and make sure we don't suffer from cancer. And the second point is this, that um, um, the tumor um, oncologist and heme oncologist, uh, they are almost um, at a point where they are saying that the chemotherapy is not going to be, is not the answer uh, for the eradication of cancer anymore. So to, if you put two things together, then the idea would be that let's talk about 
modulation of the uh, immune response in our patients with cancer, and let's see if it actually works. So this is really um, what the background is about um, multiple immunotherapies emerging uh, all over the world right now. So um, again, as I, uh, the picture really nicely depicts that the clinicians, especially the oncologist and heme oncologist, are thinking that instead of giving um, chemotherapy, let's think of giving um, immune cells and let's see if that's going to help in the eradication of cancer. Uh, my work, so there, so um, a lot of cancers, a lot of immune cells have been used uh, in the uh, treatment of cancer. Uh, it's, most of the work is in the, in, the, in the phase of clinical trials. For example, you must have heard about uh, T cells, etc., neutralizing antibody checkpoint inhibitors, etc. I would like to, uh, my work is actually uh, focused on the use of uh, natural killer cells, uh, as I would refer to them as NK cells in the pa uh, in patients diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. And I'll tell you exactly how um, I thought that this is going to be a, a, a better option for patients with acute myeloid leukemia. Just to give you a little background for our uh, junior members sitting in the room, that uh, the NK cells, it has a nice repertoire of receptors. It has these nice activating receptors, uh, for example, NKG2D, the NCRs, and specifically your CD16. Um, so that is, um, and then you have co-activating receptors like uh, 2B4 and Denim1. So these are the activating receptors which is going to produce uh, a sort of toxic response against the tumor cells. But if NK has to work, it has to make sure that the inhibitory receptors are not engaged. And the most popular inhibitory receptors on the NK cells are KIR, which is, stands for uh, killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptors. So if you want NK cell to work, um, this is what the basics has to be. Uh, in this context, you can clearly see that the NK cells, um, if, if the inhibitory receptor, that is the killer immunoglobulin-like receptor, is engaged, then even though your target cells, for example, your cancer cells, have upregulated uh, the ligand for the activating receptor, uh, even then what's going to happen is this, that if you block, if, you are, if, if the inhibitory receptor is continuously engaged, the NK is not going to work. So the best way that the NK is actually going to work, whenever you are unable, the cancer cell is going to downregulate the MHC class 1, which is the cognate ligand for your killer immunoglobulin-like receptor. NK is no longer inhibited, and then it's going to kill the target cell. So that's really the philosophy behind the NK cell therapy, that you want to go for a care care mismatch uh, if you want to treat the patients with cancer, and uh, I'll get into a little bit of detail about this as well. Um, the other thing, which is NK, uh, the, the way NK, NK cells will target your tumor cells or your cancer cell is by um, the fact that it has uh, CD16 or the FC receptor on that surface. So if you're going to have antibodies against your tumor cells, it can generate a response which is known as anti antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity. So, uh, and again, if the scientists all over the world are actually looking into it, and I'm going to, uh, again, the, talk about it a little bit. Uh, in addition, NK cells also have ligands, the dead cell ligands on its surface, uh, FAS, et cetera. So that's one way by which the NK cells can attack your cancer cells as well. So um, the reason why I'm interested in NK cells is like, why aren't you interested in using T cells against tumor cells? Why NK cells, right? I mean, all the immunologists can agree or disagree. The reason I want to focus on NK cells is this, because when the NK cells are going to uh, attack your tumor cells, they are going to release the antigen. The antigen is going to be processed by your dendritic cells. The dendritic cells are going to present the antigen to the T cells, and in this way you're able to generate an antigen-specific cytotoxic T cell response against cancer. So in my opinion, I think, so I'm literally building a case over here that you know if you're gonna go ahead with an NK cell immunotherapy, you might be able to generate an antigen-specific cytotoxic T cell response against cancer. Um, and the reason, uh, again, why, uh, so this is really what my uh, idea behind the NK cell immunotherapy is. Um, so, uh, and I hope you're kind of convinced, and I'll keep convincing you more. Um, so this is just was the, the basics about, so this is just the basics about how NKs are going to interact with the cancer cells and will, will 
lead to the lysis of the NK, of the target cells, which is your cancer cell. Um, the reason is as to why am I thinking of using NK cells in the context of acute myeloid leukemia, right? Um, if you look at acute myeloid leukemia, uh, this is the survival uh, percentage of patients who are uh, diagnosed, and uh, within this is the survival of the patients who undergo your first uh, cycle of chemotherapy. What you can actually see from this uh, graph is this: that major well, number one, majority of our patients with acute myeloid leukemia fall into this range of about 65 to 74 years of age. And uh, then again, a lot of patients with acute myeloid leukemia are more than 75 years of age. If you look at their survival, what really happens is this, that um, uh, their survival, so this is this yellow line about the patients who are above 65 to about 75 years, 74 years of age, the survival is pretty dismal if you look at five years survival. If you're looking at patients who are 75 years of age, the survival again gets really dismal. And um, keeping in mind that um, the most important, um, or as of now, the way you can treat patients with acute myeloid leukemia is you, if you give them uh, donor rubicin or anthracycline-based regimes, or the best way to cure acute myeloid leukemia would be to actually do an allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. But if majority of your patients with acute myeloid leukemia are more than 60 and 65 years of age, most of them are not going to be good candidates for allergenic stem cell transplantation. And this is exactly what, and most of them would not be able to tolerate your uh, standard donor rubicin and cytarabine based anthracycline regimes. Um, so the option is, so the question is, how, what options do we give to these elderly patients, right? And this is where I think the idea comes in my opinion, that NK cell immunotherapy, if it's not going to cure uh, the acute myeloid leukemia, but at least what it can do is give quality of life to these patients with acute myeloid leukemia who cannot take uh, immunotherapy and who would not find uh, a good donor for an allergic stem cell transplantation. The reason, again, why NK is... Um, would actually work for these elderly patients is because the NK does not, if, as, as I talked about the mechanism by which uh, NK cells interact with the cancer cells, it does not require any specific antigen receptor just like our T cells. So that's one edge uh, that the NK cell immunotherapy has over your uh, T cell therapy. And the other thing is this, that it's MHC unrestricted again. So um, this is why I'm kind of more interested in um, adding knowledge to the field as far as NK cell immunotherapy in patients with AML is concerned. So um, the other data which has been, uh, which, uh, which, the, which has come again and again, uh, which kind of builds the case again that um, NK cell therapy is actually going to do wonders in patients with acute myeloid leukemia, is that what really happens is this, that if patients are un undergoing haploidentical uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, where there is a care mismatch um, uh, in the context of a care mismatch, what really have people seen is this, that the NK cells are alloreactive under these circumstances, again building a case. So this is what... Um, this is what the care mismatch ligand has to happen, that you want to make sure that your inhibitory uh, care receptor is not engaged. You don't have that uh, uh, MHC class 1 on your uh, tumor cell. So in the case of haploidentical uh, hematopoietic, stem, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, your care ligand uh, is not present because there is a care mismatch and your inhibitory cares are not engaged. And in this context, uh, what the hematologists have actually seen is this, that there is an NK cell reactivity and patients do get a better uh, survival chance in case of haploidentical transplant. Again, building a case that uh, NK cells might actually work in patients with acute myeloid leukemia. So um, the, word, the first study which was done was not too long ago, actually. It was done in, uh, by Jay Miller at Mayo. And he actually, um, again, you know, when he started doing his work, um, which was literally an NK cell therapy, was given to 12 patients uh, with um, 65 and above of age, refractory to regular therapy. And in this case, um, what he did again, that he made sure that there is a care mismatch, so your NK cells are not uh, inhibited. Um, uh, uh, NK cell immunotherapy was infused along with um, 
uh, high dose uh, fludarabine conditioning regime and they did see uh, a graft versus leukemia effect. So this was the first uh, study that was done in humans um, uh, as far as giving NK cell therapy to patients with acute myeloid leukemia was concerned. But this, um, it was just 12 patients, it opened a Pandora box. The Pandora box was, okay, so what sort of NK cells are you gonna use to give to patients? Number two, NK cells, what's the half-life of NK cells? It's gonna be a couple of hours. The question was, how do you actually make sure that the NK cells survive in patients with acute myeloid leukemia? They wanted to give IL-2 to the patient so they can survive, but giving cytokines like IL-2 to patients uh, produced a cytokine storm. So it was not an easy ride for uh, people who were working on NK cell immunotherapy. So a lot of work, so, but this was one of the key studies that opened so many questions and people have started answering those questions now. So uh, my lab, when we started working, so my lab literally, so my lab literally wanted to work on um, uh, what is gonna be the best form of NK cells that can be given to patients with acute myeloid leukemia. And we were funded to actually work uh, um, generate data in vitro so that can, which can actually then be extrapolated and taken up by the clinicians when they take it to the clinic. So the first thing we actually did in our lab was to set up the skill genotyping and make sure that uh, whatever cells that we are testing are also care genotyped. If we are actually generating NK cells from our healthy donors, they also are care genotyped. And when we do co-cultures of our NK cells and patients with it, and the cells of patients with an acute myeloid leukemia, there is a care mismatch so that it can focus on NKLO reactivity. So that was the first thing that we did. We uh, have care. Uh, we have done care genotyping on multiple samples with acute myeloid leukemia. We also done um, care genotyping on healthy donors as well. So the next question. So the next question to the field, as I just said, is trying to answer what sort of NK cells do you want to give to patients with acute myeloid leukemia? And the field, even to date, is continuously evolving. So uh, people have said, okay, let's use adoptive NK cells that we are gonna expand ex vivo, and maybe that's gonna work as well. Um, you all have heard about CAR T cells. Uh, people were like, you know what, if the, these are elderly patients, CAR T cells might not be um, a good answer for these patients. So let's generate a CAR NK cell. So there is going to be an NK cell which is going to express a chimeric antigen receptor. And let's see if that works. So that's one idea. Uh, people have used umbilical cord blood to generate um, uh, NK cells from that. People have used induced pluripotent stem cells to generate NK cells. Again, everything is coming from a healthy donor. Um, even people have injected NK cell lines, NK cell 92 in patients with acute myeloid leukemia and proving that it's, uh, though it's an immortalized cell line, and they've actually built a case that uh, the patient's, uh, the cell line is EBV LCL negative and even you can use NK cell cell line. When we started uh, thinking about, um, okay, what NK cells are we gonna, uh, we would like to use in patients with acute myeloid leukemia, uh, we wanted to use um, NK cells from healthy donors peripheral blood. Um, we have established this uh, um, uh, this process of ex vivo expansion of NK cells in our lab. Uh, we usually start off with uh, uh, peripheral uh, NK cells from peripheral healthy donor. We usually start off with the NK cells which are uh, CD56 positive, uh, and uh, you do find uh, CD56 low NK cells in the peripheral blood uh, of regular uh, healthy adults as well. And we make sure that there is absolutely no T cell contamination when we start expanding the NK cells. Um, most of the NK most of the NK cells that we have in our periphery, uh, it has a pretty nice expression of about 20% or so of CD16 receptors. We establish um, a protocol in our lab in which we use autologous feeder cells, which are irradiated, and IL2 um, to expand NK cells, and we have actually expanded NK cells nicely for about 40 to 50 fold in our lab. And um, since we use IL-2 to expand NK cells, and this is what the whole world is doing. Uh, you don't want CD3 in your ex vivo cultures because IL-2 will also expand your T cells as well, and you're not gonna get a pure population of NK at the end of the day. So um, having said that, this is usually what our starting population is, and we do get a nice uh, 50 to 40 fold uh, expansion of the NK cells. Um, 
people have actually said that oh okay so what nk cells are going to we're going to use right so uh, people have said that the best thing to use is that you need to have cells which are cd56 dim or low uh, CD16 positive and make sure that you have a high uh, expression of NCR on those NK cells that you expand uh, before you use them in the patient. So again, uh, the theory is evolving over time. Recently, a paper was published, in fact, just a two weeks ago, that uh, there is something which is called an NK memory cell, which are uh, CD56 dim, CD16 positive, they're CD57 positive. And it seems like these cells are more cytotoxic against uh, a cancer cell. So again, the field is evolving. Uh, we don't know, again, there's a laundry list of these uh, different types of NK cells and uh, scientists on the bench are trying to figure out which NK is going to be the best. So the jury is still out on this one. As far as our NKs are concerned, after expansion, if you look at them, uh, we, do we don't get um, literally NK CD56 dim NK phenotype. What we do see, is, uh, we, don't see a, we don't get a, a CD56 high um, NK cells. We do get uh, a little CD56 low and CD56 positive NK cells. Uh, and again, um, the expansions are pretty clean. We don't see CD3 in our uh, population. And when we look at the CD50, CD16 expression on our uh, NK cell, the expression is um, uh, it's, it's not bad uh, compared to what we started off as well. We also went ahead and uh, examined for uh, the NCRs or the different uh, cytotoxic NK, NK cell receptors on our ex vivo expanded NK cells. Uh, as, you, as I just told you that not only you need to have a CD56 on your NK cells, but make sure that you have NCRs present on your NK cells as well. So this is just um, um, uh, the data showing you that um, we do get NK cells showing um, a generous CD56 of 16, that is your FCR on your NK cells. Uh, we have uh, NK cells, so NK cells which are expressing Danum 1 compared to the NK cells that we started off with or compared to the resting NK cells. Um, our XVO expanded NK cells express NKG2D. It expresses uh, a pretty nice percentage of NKP44 uh, and um, 2B4 and also NKP30. So we are at this stage right now where we are expanding NK cells nicely, which are CD56 positive and have a nice expression of NCR compared to the population that we started off with, which is our resting NK cells. So, um, okay, so now, yes, the world has NK cells in their hands and we are all geared to uh, treat patients with acute myeloid leukemia. But again, there is, uh, you know, the, it doesn't end here. The question is that, can we give NK cell immunotherapy? And this is the question that the world is dealing with right now. Can we give NK cells to all patients with acute myeloid leukemia? Or, or really want to do some bench work before we move this therapy into the clinic. And the reason why this question is important is because if you look at acute myeloid leukemia, uh, from 1985 up to 2015, every day there is a new mutation that comes up and is discovered in a patient with acute myeloid leukemia. So uh, literally every patient with acute myeloid leukemia has a specific set of uh, mutations, <coughs> hydrogenatic or genetic mutations. Uh, so the question is, Dr. Farina, you have one minute. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, I don't know what should I do. Last slide. Last slide. Okay. So uh, this is why we have to uh, tailor our um, AML um, therapy, uh, and this is exactly what my lab is doing. I'm going to just. This is pretty much my last slide. If I. So a lot of work has been done as far as the allergenic NK. So the work is still in the progress and what you can actually see over here is this that um, as I said initially you know that the NK cells work in the context of ADCC um, what and you must have heard about checkpoint inhibitors so people are now thinking that while we are working on the NK cells it's also good to think about using um, um, monoclonal antibodies against the AML cells, anti-CD3, gemtuzumab, or checkpoint inhibitors along with the NK cell therapy. So you might end up with a combination. And last but not the least, um, this is the last slide and the depressing slide that uh, the all people who are working in NK cell immunotherapy or for that matter any cellular immunotherapy in patients with cancer, they have to th think of one thing and this, 
that if you're going to give these immune cells to the patients, they're going to migrate in your tumor microenvironment and might actually get dysregulated. So keep that in mind. And uh, the world is still struggling because there are multiple cells like the Tregs, etc., which might render your healthy um, cellular immunotherapy components um, dysfunctional in the tumor microenvironment. So um, the field is continuously evolving, and we hope for the best. Well, uh, I just want to thank um, my oncology hematology colleagues and from funds from Higher Education Commission of Pakistan, which has helped us in setting up this uh, work in our lab. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farina, for such an informative lecture. And uh, the forum is open for the questions. Uh, if uh, there is any question, uh, Professor Dr. Rabia would like to ask him. What category do they fall under? They are just dysfunctional, exhausted. Well, the numbers are low. The NCRs goes down. So and the so the numbers are low. But what's the phenotype? Okay, absolutely. So the phenotype, uh, the numbers are low, and the phenotype would be around CD56 positive. You don't have, you don't see CD56 low uh, cytotoxic. Can you activate them in vitro? Well, again, that's a good question. Uh, the, it's a great idea that why don't take the autologous NK cells, activate them in vitro, and give it to give it back to the patients. What we are thinking is this: that um, uh, I don't know. It, it would be tough to actually take those cells out, upregulate NCRs on them because we don't know uh, as to if we were able to, you know, recycle those NCR back. So. Um, as well and we know that there are uh, antigens like BCG which actually activate the natural killer cell and have been shown to afford some protection in tumor patients. Yes, we can do that, but you know, if you are going to use your allergenic ex vivo expanded NK cells, you can have that kir mismatch which might make NK cells more reactive compared to the autologous. Well, you can, yeah, but we're looking at a graph versus leukemia effect, so I'll be more tailored towards using an allergenic NK cells in that way. Any other questions? Najia. Thank you, Dr. Faina, for such a wonderful talk. I uh, just wanted to uh, build up my question uh, as a follow-up of Dr. Rabia. I'm just wondering that BCG also has uh, uh, some uh, uh, PAP, uh, PAMP uh, like uh, structures and they can activate NK cells and some of the results uh, in our lab also showed some granzyme uh, activation. So just wondering is there any group working on uh, particularly on using the BCG ligand or something uh, uh, with uh, to augment the NK response um, in uh, uh, immunotherapy? and. I have never heard about that, but it's a great idea yeah. uh, that if you really want to activate NK cells in vivo, in, vi uh, in and vitro, yeah. in vitro, and yeah. maybe if you yeah. want to vaccinate people with BCG, yeah. in yeah. vitro, and then yes, so that yeah. would be a very viable option. Then um, the keeping NK cells active in vivo would would this might work. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and another question is uh, uh, you just mentioned the use of cell line. So I'm just wondering what is the ethical concern of uh, giving the cell line to patients? Yeah, that's just. Yeah, it's a huge issue. And uh, so this is exactly why the people did use NK92. They made the case that the patients were are going to be EBV LCL negative and the cell line was generated from a healthy NK donor. So they have done that. I think those are desperate attempts, but at the end of the day, you'll have to generate those nice, EBV negative, not immortalized or genetically unmodified NK cells uh, for patients. Because uh, again, we're talking about 65 year old patients with AML, you don't want to do that. Yes, yeah, so you can't. So because of the age group, it's just going to 
uh, not work and that this is I think this is NK 92s never worked and that's why people are now looking into uh, sources of NK that needs XPBO expansion. Can I ask one question? Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if I'm sorry. Can I, I'm, can I, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just thinking these NK cells, they are not antigen specific. So yes, these are absolutely. The part of the innate immune system. Yeah. So if you are activating it or growing it uh, in uh, vitro and then uh, if you want to give it in vivo, so won't these cells are going to attack not specifically other cells? Not only the tumor cells, but m might be giving, going to give. More yes, exactly. I think yeah. So I'm glad that you've asked this question. So again, you know, this is the question that every when you work on cellular immunotherapies, you need to understand the cancer as well and your patient population. So when you're talking about NK cell immunotherapy, it's not going to be T, T antigen specific. We just want to make sure that some. We are hoping that the NK cells will be able to lyse the, uh, the tumor cell. It's going to release the antigen. The antigen will be taken up by the DCs and might um, upregulate a certain antigen specific T cell response only if the T cells are functional in patients with acute myeloid leukemia. So, again, something to prove as well. Um, if you want to generate a, a T cell response, antigen specific T cell response, I think we have to think about CAR T then, right? So, um, so NK cell, we have to keep in mind that um, the, the informed decision would be that you have to kind of imagine that the T cells will be normal in that patient. And that is going to, because using T cells in patients 65 years above of age, specifically CAR T, you, there's a huge chance of graft versus host disease versus then graft versus leukemia. So again, uh, in my opinion, CAR Ts are not going to work uh, in this age group at all. So NK probably is your answer. Maybe the uh, tumor but yes, it is not antibodies and NK cells, maybe that combination would work then. That can also work. And what we are doing right now is this, that um, uh, to kind of answer your question that um, we have a huge bank of primary AML cells with multiple genetic and cytogenetic abnormalities. We're actually testing this in the, in the dish right now because that why are we giving NK cells to everybody? One size is not going to fit all every NK patient has a different mutation. So why not first test this in a dish and say, okay, it's going to work for this patient and not for that patient. So when you move into the clinic, it's going to be more judicious. Okay. Uh, so yes. Dr. Yeah. Farina, very short question. Uh, what Hi. is the monitoring uh, uh, algorithm for these patients when you are uh, giving them the immunotherapy? How do you follow? Uh, Absolutely. So uh, as you look at the data that I presented and the questions, specific the inhibition of tumor microenvironment. So at this point in time, this is not in the clinic. Okay. So <laughs> we, we don't know which NK to give. We don't know how to make them live in the patient. Um, and um, we don't know how to deal with the tumor microenvironment. So the field is evolving. So even at this point in time, as I'm talking right now, the standard of care for patients with acute myeloid leukemia still is allergenic uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Uh, Dr. Farina, just a short question. Uh, can, we give, uh, can you give uh, NK cell immunotherapy with other medications? Or is there any specific recommendations that you follow for that? So again, as I said, and uh, the, the similar question that there are no guidelines. So for example, for chemotherapy, we have guidelines, right? So with the NK cells, there are so many unanswered questions that even uh, American Society of Hematology or British Society of Hematology, there are no guidelines. So it's not in the clinic. We have these small little, little trials going up. As far as drugs are concerned, I think the best way to use NK would be to, uh, as, and again, as I showed in one of my slides, that you can use checkpoint inhibitors maybe combine them with it. It's just not going to be NK alone. Maybe use anti-CD33, which has been used in patients, and that might um, create an effective ADCC response in patients. So it'll, it'll be a mix and match. It's just not going to be NK alone as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dina, for your time and addressing the questions. Uh, now we move to the uh, free paper se uh, session after a very exciting uh, two invited uh, lectures. Uh, and our first uh, uh, free paper uh, uh, will be presenting by uh, Arij Fatma from Indus Hospital Health Network. And she is going to present uh, uh, significance of and uh, Okay. Beg your pardon? 
Uh, free paper is, Rabia, uh, is going to present by Rab uh, Rabia Siddiqa, University of Health Sciences, Lahore, and her topic of presentation is Association of HLA DRB1 uh, Complex with Susceptibility in COVID-19 Patient. Over to doc uh, Dr. Rabia Siddiqa. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, everyone. I'm Rabia Siddiqa from University of Health Sciences, Lahore. The topic of my research uh, paper is uh, association of HLA DR beta 1 complex with susceptibility to COVID 19 disease. Coronavirus disease is caused by coronavirus severe acute respiratory syndrome virus. The clinical spectrum of COVID 19 varies from asymptomatic or symptomatic forms to clinical conditions characterized by respiratory failure that necessitate mechanical ventilation and support in an ICU to multi organ and systemic manifestation in terms of sepsis, septic shock, and multi organ dysfunction syndromes. Host genotype uh, can also influence the possible outcome of the disease. A large body of evidence has been provided regarding the relationship between the genetic variations of major histocompatibility complex and a wide range of infectious potential, potentially posing the global health threat such as SARS. The role of human leukocyte antigens complex appears particularly interesting. Its genetic variability is directly associated with individual variations in the immune response against uh, pathogens and susceptibility to uh, protection against infectious disease. HLA gene complex is a locus of genes present in chromosome 6. Uh, it uh, codes proteins. Uh, sorry, I can't see. Most polymorphic genes and this fact has been proven for uh, some viral uh, disease like H1N1, influenza and HIV. In previous stages, it has been identified that HLA DR beta 1 complex alleles has a significant association with COVID 19 disease progression worldwide, but no study was found on the association with protection or resistance to disease. Uh, some, in some studies, we found, found the HLA DR beta 1 in uh, Japan population, uh, DR beta 101 in Mexican population, and HLA DR uh, beta 104 in Iranian population. HLA-DR beta 1 is a highly polymorphic region, so this study aims to identify the association of HLA-DR beta 1 complex alleles with susceptibility or protection is COVID-19 patients. Uh, the study objective of uh, my study are uh, association of HLA-DR beta 1 complex with the susceptibility or resistance against COVID-19 disease and allelic frequencies of DR beta 1 complex in healthy controls and cases of COVID-19. This study consists of the 106 COVID-19 patients and 53 healthy controls conducted at Department of Immunology, University of Health Sciences, Lahore. Group uh, in, in including criteria, group one includes healthy people of more than 18 years of age, and group two includes patients having 18 years or older with clinical signs of pneumonia, dyspnea, lab confirmed SARS-CoV-2 positive by PCR. Immunocompromised people or having uh, people having bone marrow transplant, B-cell lymphoma, or any chronic disease were excluded from the study. 3 ml of uh, venous blood from each subject uh, was drawn in EDT tube. A DNA uh, was extracted through the favor prep genomic DNA extraction kit from whole blood and uh, uh, SSP PCR performed by sequence specific primers to amplify the genome. Gel electrophoresis performed uh, uh, for the analysis of HLA-DR beta 1 allele expression. Uh, this is a list of primers that I uh, used in my study. Uh, the gel shows uh, that uh, lane uh, represents the uh, DNA ladder, negative control, and DR1 to uh, 10 amplification. Uh, the total of uh, 159 subjects were recruited in this study, which includes 106 diagnosed patients and 53 healthy controls. Patients were diagnosed on the basis of clinical evaluation and lab findings by uh, real-time PCR. Association uh, was found by using pearson chi test and p-value of less than 0.05 considered as statistically significant. Analysis of the 10 common HLA DR beta 1 alleles revealed a significant association of DR beta 13, DR beta 04, DR beta 5, and 6 with COVID-19. However, no significant association of other alleles were detected with risk score protection. This graph shows the frequency of the uh, all uh, 10 DR beta alleles in healthy controls and uh, COVID-19 cases. Uh, this table shows that the DR beta 3, 4, 5, and 6 has a, a significant association with protection of COVID-19 disease. 
Host susceptibility or resistance to infectious disease is strongly affected by genetic variations in immune system. In the current study, association of DR beta 1 complex alleles were evaluated with respect to COVID-19 in Pakistani population which were not documented previously in this region. The 10 most common alleles complex were examined for their potential role in disease resistance or protection COVID-19. This study revealed a protective role of DR beta 1 in COVID-19 disease in contrast to the previous studies. Uh, so I conclu uh, we concluded that the result of the uh, current study indicates DR beta 1 alleles are associated with protection or resistance in COVID-19 disease which may help to reduce the susceptibility towards the disease. I am thankful to uh, uh, my worthy teachers and uh, uh, especially Dr. Shahjah uh, that gave me the opportunity to work uh, under his supervision in the HEC project because uh, this study is also part of the uh, COVID-19 research study uh, funded by Higher Education Commission. And I am also thankful to Dr. Fahim Shahzad. Uh, he also guided me uh, during this uh, study course. Thank you. Forum is open for questions. We can have quick two questions. Uh, so uh, you said that the HLA-DRB1 and uh, HLA antigens have both uh, protective as well as uh, the, I mean susceptibility uh, association. Which DRB1 anti uh, antigens had uh, susceptibility and which DRB1 antigen had protective? Uh, in, uh, in previous stu uh, studies, I uh, not found the protective role. I found that the DR beta 3 uh, has a uh, role in sus uh, towards susceptibility and DR4. Uh, oh, but but did you compare with, um, how, how did you uh, came to this conclusion? Did you compare with the controls? I mean, there's so much diversity of these antigens, right? And if you're saying that the patients are, have this protective uh, association or the uh, susceptibility association, then you have to compare, right, uh, the two groups. So how did you arrive to this conclusion then? Uh, Ma'am, I guess uh, this is uh, also due to the uh, population difference. Population difference be ho sakte. Actually, the basic question is, what is the uh, frequency of HL, this uh, in the population? Okay. Are there differences in different population? There are differences. We know that. So in Pakistan, आप basically वो दिखा सकती हैं हमारे पास जो data है controls का and patients का वहाँ से थोड़ा सा madam को अंदाज़ा हो जाएगा आप या yes ma'am बिल्कुल मैम इस चीज को हमने काफी डिस्कस भी किया था कि प्रीवियस स्टडीज के अंदर दे वर रिपोर्टिंग दैट देर इज अ रिस्क ऑफ हैविंग स्वीयर डिजीज और समथिंग लाइक दैट बट इन आर स्टडी वी वर नॉट एबल टू फाइंड रिस्क राधा देन वी हैड फाइंड प्रोटेक्टिव रोल बट इट मे बी बिकॉज़ ऑफ वी हैव इंक्लूडेड so, yeah, maybe increasing the number of controls as well, that could be much more uh, better for this study. Yeah. We had already calculated the sample size, but... Uh, uh, basically, ma'am, uh, it were towards severity of disease. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, actually... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you, Rabia Siddiqui. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay. The second presentation on this forum. Uh, Arij Fatma from Indus Hospital and uh, she will talk about association um, significance okay significance of uh, anti I cannot read it 
just print on print them. Okay, you start. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, this is Sayyid Ayesh Padma uh, from Indus Hospital Health Network. Uh, I'm here to present a topic on significance of entire ribosomal pre-protein antibodies in the diagnosis of autoimmune diseases um, in a local population, a single center study. Uh, I have nothing to disclose over here. So uh, the outline of my presentation would be, uh, it includes a brief introduction about the autoimmune diseases and the aims and objectives, methodology, results and discussions, and the concluding my slides and the conclusion. So uh, systematic immune disorder uh, is basically occurs when a body's own immune systems attacks its cells, tissues, and uh, the state can be an organ-specific or non-organ-specific. Systematic lupus arthritis is uh, one of the prototype of the state and which is mar uh, widely marked by the inflammation and tissue damage. The etiology and pathogenesis of state can be multi uh, multifactorial. As you can see in the diagram over here, uh, some gene mutations, environmental factors, and hormonal changes. Autoantibodies and SLE, as a SLE is widely spread, uh, marked by the widely uh, spectrum of uh, autoantibodies like ANA, anti-IDS DNA, and ANA-specific autoantibodies. Um, so uh, more specifically, I will talk about the entire ribosomal p-protein antibody, uh, which show a high specificity for the SLE and are mainly located into the cytoplasm and the nucleus of a cell. Uh, it also showed a very predictive and prognostic values uh, with the SLE patients. So the rate, of, the positive rate of entire ribosomal p-protein with the SLE is between 10 to 40 percent, uh, among which the Asian population shows the highest rate. Uh, as you know, the uh, Dogal leg data at Karachi uh, has a very scarce and shown no prevalence with the entire ribosomal pre-protein and its association with the other autoantibodies, which leads to my aims and objectives. So uh, the aims and objective of my presentation is to analyze the prevalence of entire ribosomal pre-protein in SLE patients to find out their association with other autoantibodies, mainly for the ANA-specific antibodies and to study the clinical significance in a population. The methodology was, as it is a retrospective study, it analyzed a data from a area of uh, January 2020 to May 2022, around of uh, 1.5 years. Uh, the place of study was at the Department of Immunology at Indus Hospital and Health Network. Uh, all the data was extracted uh, from the hospital by through their electronic media, which contained all the positive rates, which, showed, uh, which resulted uh, on for the patient who had been tested in this area of 2022 to May 2022. Uh, I've also taken an IRB approval for the ethical approval. So uh, the methodology is for the testing of anti-nuclear antibody uh, and the entire DS DNA uh, by a methodology of immunofluorescent assay. And uh, for the ANA antigen specific antibodies, uh, we have utilized the immunoblot, we have used the immunoblot technique against uh, some of the autoantibodies like MI, KU, SSA, RO52, uh, BMSCL70, and ribosomal P protein with histones and nucleosomes. All the data was analyzed by using an SPSS version 20 by applying the car scars and T test. Uh, so the demographic of my results were 92% uh, of the patients which reported positive for entire ribosomal pre protein were 37, among which 92% were female and only 8% were male, with a ratio of 11 is to 1. And the age, mean age uh, of the patients were 29 years, uh, with a range of 10 to 56 years. So. Here you can see, um, in the area of January 2022, May 2022, 1,500 patients were tested for the ENA profile, among which the 37 were showed a positive ratio uh, for the entire isomer P-protein, while the rest of them are negative. Among those 37 who were reported uh, for the entire isomer P-protein, 92% were positive for ENA, 50% were positive for entire DS DNA, uh, while uh, the Ribosomal P protein always coexisted with the other autoantibodies apart from, um, and the cytoplasmic staining showed the 38%. Among that, 38%, only 77% showed the positive ratio with the ANA, while the rest of the 33% showed a negative ANA. The ANA patterns, which were mm, uh, analyzed and which were determined during this uh, study, was mostly 
uh, the homogeneous, 21%, uh, while the least were for the speckles, mixed pattern, and only one showed intercellular bridge pattern for the ANA. So, uh, with the entire ribosome of pre-protein, the highest uh, number of nucleosome in histones shows the highest percentage of coexistence with the entire ribosome of protein, which is then followed by the SSA and RNP. Uh, when the other clinical laboratories and correlations were seen uh, with the entire ribosome of pre-protein positive patients, here you can see uh, the entire nucleosome in histones and entire DS DNA basically show a highest percentage of abnormal clinical results in association with the ribosome of pre-proteins. Um, so concluding my slides over here, entire ribosome of pre-protein always found coexisting with the other autoantibodies and uh, the uh, antibodies can be useful in predicting of various clinical manifestations and their severity in SLE patients in the presence of other autoantibodies. The presence of ANA pattern is due to the coexistence of uh, other autoantibodies with the entire ribosome of P-proteins. The entire histones and nucleosome, as you have seen in the last previous slide, show a high percentage of coexistence with entire ribosome of P-proteins, and uh, which is then followed by the entire DS, DNA, and SSA. Um, entire ribosome of P-proteins, when found with a nucleosome in histones, it shows the most relevant clinical abnormal results for the patients of SLE. Um, the results of this retrospective study may uh, help us to investigate a large number of population because it's just uh, a few number which we have just analyzed. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge all my team members who have worked with me and my supervisor, Dr. Sabia Anis. That's all. Thank you. So forum is open for uh, two questions. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sidra, for a nice talk. I'm just wondering, uh, I don't know wh in which depth you have collected metadata, but if you can comment on the female preponderance and also the age group of that female, if you have looked at particularly. But I'm just wondering what was the age group of those uh, females. And I'm also wondering whether you have checked complements uh, uh, in these patients or not. Um, thank you for the question. My name is Reesh Fatma. <laughs> Uh, you might have said someone else's name. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the question was, uh, right, actually, uh, if I got a bit more time, I will show you the clinical features we have been going through, uh, basically including the low TLC as, as well as the low complement count. And the age group for the females, specifically for the females, I have to go through it, but the range of the study was from the 10 years to the 56 years. Yeah, specifically for the female, I have to look on it. Right? No problem. Anyone else? Thank you, Rich, for a good no. presentation. I'm just, uh, I just uh, uh, want, I may be missed. How many in a negative patients you enrolled? Because you said the uh, majority uh, were coexisted, entire ribosomal pro P proteins coexisted existed with other autoantibodies. So, how many were in a negative? Because that would make a big difference. Okay, uh, as you know, I have uh, basically analyzed patients of the data from the year of January 2022, May 2022, which include a uh, prox uh, for the test patient of ENA profile, 1,500, among which only 37 were counts for positive for the entire episomal protein. Among that, which basically my inclusion criteria was to segregate for the patients who have been showed a positive ratio for the entire episomal P proteins and the rest of them for the negative. That was my excluding criteria. When I, I further evaluate those positive uh, ribosomal P uh, for the patients who show the positive rate for the ribosomal P protein among that 37, uh, approx more than, more than like um, uh, 34, um, among that 37, 34, like uh, making up a percentage of 90s for the ANA positive, while the rest of few show the negative results. So there was a high high number of patients which showed the positive. Over oh, ANA positive. Yes. And rest for ANA negative. Over ANA negative. So you in incorporated a big number of ANA negative as well. Even then, uh, how come ANA negatives are giving other autoantibody positivity positivity apart from anti-ribosomal P protein? This is a big question. In that case, ANA should be positive. No, no, no. There are other uh, antibodies as well which can give you uh, ANA, ANA negativity, negative like anti-RO antibodies. Uh, ANA can be negative in that case also. And also we have seen that some of the uh, autoantibodies, like even histones and nucleosomes, when they're in low titers, 
they give you a positivity over uh, on the ENA, but they are negative on the ANA. Even if you are uh, using low titers and that. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So, uh, our uh, third uh, uh, free paper, uh, which is uh, which will be presented by Muhammad Zain Arshad, and the topic is development and validation of in-house HEP2 cell slides. Uh, Mr. Muhammad Zain Arshad. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, most merciful. Global burden of autoimmune diseases is 5%. Average diagnostic delay is 5 years. And it takes at least 5 doctor visits to reach proper diagnosis. Autoimmune diseases are still not recognized as urgent health issues, yet sharing major portion of morbidity and mortality. Have you ever thought why? I shall be presenting my research project that is development and validation of in-house HEP2 cell slide for detection of anti-nuclear antibodies by indirect immunofluorescence. Anti-nuclear antibodies are used for screening of autoimmune disorders and can be detected by different immunoassays like indirect immunofluorescence which is gold standard and enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Indirect immunofluorescence is mostly performed using human epithelial type 2 cell as a substrate. They are superior to other substrate because they have large nuclei, so patterns are clear, and high rate of mitosis help in detection of mitosis-specific antibodies. ANA testing by indirect immunofluorescence is only limited to tertiary care facilities, and high cost limits its use as a screening test. We decided to plug this gap by developing in-house HEP2 cell slide, which can decrease cost of ANA screening. Rationale behind this study was to develop in-house HEP2 cell slide, which will decrease price of ANA detection while increasing overall sensitivity and in-house method will be standardized. This proof of concept study was conducted at Armed Forces Institute of Pathology over a period of six months. Study design was cross-sectional validation and consecutive non-random sampling technique was used for sample size of 305. Patients were inducted as per mentioned criteria. Our set of experiments consisted of have two cell subculturing on slide fixation, and then staining. In first series of experiments, we took multi-well plastic and teflon clotted glass slides. Few slides of each type were seeded with HEP2 cell suspension of 3,000 cells per ml and 300,000 cells per ml. Then few slides from each group were enriched at 90 minutes with minimum essential medium. All slides were incubated in 5% carbon dioxide incubator. Then these slides were then enriched at 12, 24, 36, and 42 hours for cell growth and death. This is microscopic picture of plastic slide taken at 90 minutes. Very few cells are present in wells in which 3,000 cells per ml suspension was used. Further observation of plastic slide seeded with 300,000 cells per ml suspension at 12 hours showed better growth of cells and less death in those wells which were enriched at 90 minutes with nutritional media as compared to non-enriched wells. These are microscopic pictures of wells of plastic slide taken at 24 hours. These microscopy pictures of plastic slide are taken at 36 hours. There is greater cell death as compared to 24 hours and more prominent in non-enriched wells. At 42 hours, there is increase in cell death. These are microscopy pictures of glass slide. There is no growth of cells and maximum cells are dead. So it was concluded from first series of experiments that it is better to subculture have two cells for 24 hours on plastic slide using suspension of 300,000 cells per ml and 90 minute enrichment is necessary. In second series of experiments, we took three different suspension of three, four, and 500,000 cells per ml and subculture on different set of plastic slides. These are microscopic pictures of slides subculture with suspension having 300,000 cells per ml. This slide shows result of suspension having count of 400,000 cells per ml. This slide shows result of suspension having count of 500,000 cells per ml. So it was concluded from second set of experiment that it is better to seed slide with HEP2 cell suspension of 400,000 cells per ml. Now slide made from suspension having count of 400,000 cells per ml were fixed with four different fixation protocols. Only methanol and formaldehyde were able to fix slides. Formaldehyde fixed slide with non-positive sera showed more cytoplasmic staining. 
in our last set of experiment we kept few methanol fixed in house light at minus 20 and few at 4 to 8 degrees centigrade then these slide was stained with known sera as subsequent days we observed gradual increase in cytoplasmic staining after 10 days therefore recommended storage time at minus 20 is 10 days Validation of in-house HEP2 cell slide was done by testing sera of 305 patients on in-house and commercial HEP2 cell slides. Then these slides were interpreted by two different observers, keeping them blinded for results interpreted by each other. Results were analyzed using two into two table. These were the results shown by different patient seras on in-house slides. Sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value were high. Inter-observer agreement was 99.7% and percentage agreement was 97%. Keeping in view test burden of previous years, adoption of in-house HEP2 cell slides only in our center could have saved 14 million. I would like to conclude by saying that in-house HEP2 cell slides are as effective as commercial HEP2 cell slides and can be used as cost-effective alternative. I thank you all for patient listening. Arshad, the forum is open for uh, two questions. Ma'am. So the problem is with the validation. Yes, ma'am. For how many patterns you have validated your uh, HEP2 cells, and for each pattern, because you are doing a validation for the use in lab, right? Uh, and for uh, each pattern, how many samples you have used then? Ma'am, actually, we inducted uh, 305 patients. Yes. These were not known patients. Then we uh, use uh, as a commercial slide as a gold standard. Out of 305 patients, 65 came positive and uh, are around uh, 241 negative. No, no, and I got that. But for each pattern, because you know you are going, even with the HEP2 cells from the commercial uh, uh, suppliers, we can have problems uh, in identifying the patterns and the relative anti uh, ready because of the differences in the antigens, they are expressed on the HEP2 cells, even uh, by the commercial labs. So how you have uh, validated each pattern on these HEP2 cells? You, you have shown that speckle, homogeneous, and I think centromeric, Ma but there's so many patterns, and uh, especially we can get you know uh, mixed patterns as well. So for each pattern, how many samples you have used for each pattern? Ma'am, uh, for most of basic patterns, including homogeneous, peripheral, nucleolar, core speckled, fine speckled, and centromere. These six patterns, at least we inducted five uh, samples for each pattern. You think we, that we, was enough? If you're using... Ma'am, ma as this is continuous learning, we, are, uh, uh, we will uh, keep on adding that into our sample, but... Uh, how we confident have, we you will be to use these... Uh, I mean, how confident you will be to use these uh, HEP2 cells in your lab? And if you're getting negative test results, will you be confident enough to report that? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a small comment to Dr. Sabiha's observation. In the first, this is a multi-step process. Uh, we are all, always working on creating in-house standardized alternatives to high cost commercial uh, techniques which are available. So in the first step, we worked primarily on identifying the optimum, the seeding value, the cells, then uh, how to fix it and store it and multiple procedures. So this is basically the validation of the procedure. What you are asking is uh, very pertinent and this is, uh, which is the validation of the procedure by keeping a certain uh, sample size for each pattern and then going with it. So initially, as per the validation procedure, we did not specify specifically uh, any particular number of samples for the different patterns. We just made sure that we had at least five of each sample so that the statistics should not be incorrect. We, we plan to proceed uh, and uh, to work with identifying different patterns and then uh, validate it further. This is ongoing.
No, there are no commercial concerns involved. As, as yeah, so also previously at AFIP. It, uh, don't you think it's a futile... Uh, <laughs> I, I'll just lay out uh, the exact gap which we were trying to plug with this. As, as you would know, when previously you, we used to do the in-house, the rat liver substrate, we used to, we worked with it for a long time uh, because yes, uh, because of we have moved so much to yeah further. so now if uh, the difference between this in-house slide and the commercial slide cost us about 1200 rupees so we are now we are just like a public sector tertiary care center providing services to defense forces as well as a lot of government departments so we have that worry about finances so the inter observer agreement was very good the percentage agreement between commercial and HEP2 slides was very good. We'll work on the patterns, which is so rightly pointed out. Uh, but with the, uh, with the, with the cap uh, uh, we don't. We are not working with cap. Uh, we work with UK Nagas. Yes, we yes we use the samples. We uh, didn't show it here, but we are part of the UK Nagas uh, external quality assurance. Can I ask one question? And that is validation is a long-term process. And you have already talked about how much money you will save. I think until it's fully validated, you cannot even use it in the house. You have to make sure that it's a fully validated test, and then you can use it in house. You'll still have to keep comparing with the commercial kits to make sure that your results are consistent if you are doing patients. And the costing of it will come after that because every step costs. I have a small question. What dilutions you used for in-house assay and what was the dilution of commercial kit? Uh, something about Ma'am, uh, for commercial kit, it was 1 is to 40 dilution. And uh, in our initial experiment, we used different dilutions, uh, but uh, validation and all that process was done at 1 is to 40 dilution. Uh, so, very short question. Yes, uh, how how did you enrich, and what do you mean by enrichment and non-enrichment of the cells? Ma'am, uh, by enrichment, I mean uh, enriching cell or adding nutritional media, which is minimum essential medium, containing all nutritional ingredients of cell which are, which grow as uh, ad adherent cell, like have two cells. Ma'am, basically two types of cells. There are adherent cells which grow uh, adherent to slides like HEP2 cell, and there are few cells like blood cells which grow uh, as a suspended medium, like for uh, which we use RPIMIS. How can you compare uh, by not doing uh, the enrichment with other groups? Ma'am, uh, commercial slides are already enriched, they are fixed. And uh, as uh, in-house slide, we have to prepare them, we have to grow them on slides, and then we have to enrich and fix them. Uh, thank you, uh, Mama Zain. Uh, our uh, last uh, free paper uh, presenter is uh, uh, Habza Faruqi from the University of Health Sciences, and she is going to present the monitoring of uh, durability and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccine-induced immunity. Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. I'm Hafsa Faruqi and I'm a student from Molecular Pathology at Dow University of Health Sciences. And my research is on monitoring durability and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccine-induced immunity. Uh, so we know at the end of November 2019, there was an emergence of uh, unreported cases of pneumonia in Wuhan, China. And later the WHO declared the COVID-19 as a pandemic and SARS-CoV-2 was identified as its etiological agent. From then up till now, there have been several clinical trials in trying to find out the uh, treatment methods for uh, COVID-19. However, there's no specific recommended treatment for curing the disease, but there are medications available to manage the symptoms. And so the potential solution in driving out this pandemic lies in attaining herd immunity in our population because of which vaccinations drive began. And as we have seen in previous pandemics and outbreaks, this is how we wipe out the diseases. So, uh, however, we do not know how effective these vaccines are in our population. And for that, in this study, we are studying two basic uh, components for uh, analyzing the vaccine efficacy. For the humoral response, we're studying the specific uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies and the non-specific interferon gamma, the cell-mediated immune response as well. Uh, so, so far, 132 million people in Pakistan have been fully vaccinated 
while 47 million are the ones that have received booster doses as of yet. Uh, the objectives of our study was to evaluate for how long and how much these immune responses last uh, uh, due to the uh, immunization processes in our population and to see whether they are effective in, uh, in eliminating reinfection rates and to see when our population becomes susceptible to the disease again. So for this we collected samples, uh, we collected blood samples of uh, vaccinated individuals and we asked them to fill a questionnaire and we measured their uh, quantitative antibody levels as well as interferon gamma using ELISA. We collected samples at six different point time points at baseline, then two weeks later, three weeks later, three months, six months, and then nine months later. Uh, we, used, uh, we measured interferon gamma using ELISA and we measured anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies using the ECLIF. The questionnaire aimed to collect uh, patient demo, uh, sorry, subject demographics, see if they have any comorbidities, and to see if they have any history of COVID-19, so that we could separate out the antibodies from the natural infection, natural immune response, and the uh, vaccination immune response. Our study demographics showed that our participants were 55% were males and 45% were females. The mean age was 35.7 with a standard deviation of 2.4 years. Uh, these are antibody results where we see that there was a gradual increase in antibodies from baseline to two weeks. Uh, but then three, at three weeks, when the, this is where the second dose of vaccination was given to most individuals. From here, there was a steep increase up till six months. But then after six months, there again, there was a steep decrease um, in the antibody concentration as we have observed in our nine month sample. These are mean antibody levels. Among our three vaccination groups, we saw that in Pfizer, Sinovac, and Sinopharm, all three followed the same consistent pattern in which uh, there was a st steep increase up till six months of our antibodies, but then at the nine month sample, we saw that there was a decrease in antibody levels. Uh, the highest antibody response we observed was in the Pfizer group. However, we see that even in the Pfizer group, there was a gradual decrease at the nine month sample. These are the interferon gamma concentrations at baseline. There was 24.3, two weeks, 22.1, three weeks, 22.2, three months, 20.4, six months, 21.6, and at nine months, 22.1. However, these are statistically insignificant, so we cannot associate them to our immune responses. Um, the results of our study was that we saw that the antibody titer started falling after six months of vaccination, and we also saw that this is where we also started getting a lot of reinfection rates in our participants as we asked them to fill a questionnaire, and this is when most of them started telling us that, yes, we had COVID in the past two, three weeks. Um, so, and we also saw that there is no statistically significant difference in the interferon gamma levels, so for the cell-mediated immune response, we need to study another parameter. Uh, we also saw that efficacy of Pfizer is highest, then Sinopharm, then Sinovac, and this is consistent with other studies reported worldwide. Um, we also saw that there's an immediate need for booster doses because if our immune response is waning with time, especially at the six month timeline, this means our population will become susceptible to reinfection once again, to severe infection once again, and this will create a burden on the public health sector. So um, booster doses shouldn't just be voluntary anymore, they should be encouraged and uh, everyone should get booster doses as soon as possible. Um, that said, this, I would like to thank my professor, supervisors, Dr. Said, Dr. Janet, Dr. Muniba, and other team members of my project, Dr. Bilal, Ms. Maria, Ms. Tuba, Ms. Hafsa, and Ms. Hira. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The forum is open for the question. Two questions? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, interesting study. What I don't still am sure about is at what level is the antibody protective because at nine months, it's only slightly down. Yeah. So why are you saying it should be compulsory? Uh, <laughs> I think that all the, once it's 50% mm. or whatever your levels were, I don't know, these are total antibodies, I yes. guess, not IgG antibodies. No, no, or no, only IgG these, antibodies. no, these are total antibodies. So. Basically, you know, th those were protected, you said. Yes, they are protected. So mm. those levels are also protective. Yes, you're so right. If it falls down a little bit, why should you give? Because this is, this is at the know, time point. You don't know if you should give because 
My major concern is the mm -hmm. long COVID, and that if you give it in people who already have antibody and continue to do it, you can um, induce autoantibodies, mm -hmm. and it will be detrimental rather than beneficial. Okay. So don't make statements like this. Yep. Until you <laughs> it's only because we saw that this is also where we started getting reinfection. That's why uh, we gave it a vulnerable time point. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we again move to the uh, invited lectures, and uh, I am honored and privileged to introduce Dr. Usman Yusuf. Uh, Dr. Usman Yusuf is an allergist immunologist practicing for the last 30 years in Pakistan and other countries. He is a clinician, a medical researcher, an academician, an ed educationist, and a social worker. Dr. Usman was the founder and head of the Department of Allergy and Immunology at the Pakistan Institute of Medical Sciences, Islamabad in 1993. And later he established the Allergy and Asthma Institute, Pakistan uh, in 1996. He is a member of several international committee and organization including the World Health Organization and the NIHR UK. He was remained a member of the Global Allergen, Allergen Immunotherapy Expert Committees and authored many papers and report on this project. Dr. Swan has delivered several lectures and conducted training on allergy diagnosis and tre uh, treatment at our PSI uh, symposia and workshop. Uh, today his talk will be entirely practical and aimed at basic and clinical immunologist on how we can help improve allergy treatment facilities in Pakistan since allergic diseases affect more than 20% of our uh, population. To over to Dr. Swan Yusuf. Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you. First of all, allow me to apologize that I cannot be with you in person, but that's how circumstances are. The topic that we're going to be talking about today is successful allergy vaccination. And that, that is something which only you, the immunologist, can do. And this is very important because this is one thing which has not been properly um, practiced in Pakistan so far. Allergen immunotherapy or allergy immunotherapy, allergy vaccination is basically um, the only form of treatment which is known to be able to modify the course of the disease. And which disease? It's talking about IgE-mediated allergic diseases. And this is probably the closest that we can come to a cure. So allergen immunotherapy is effective in those diseases which are caused by IgE, sorry, and in non-IgE mediated disease, it is not very effective or not effective at all. These include allergic rhinitis, where it's probably the most uh, well-established and well-documented. Allergic asthma, this has been a subject of controversy over the years, but now it's been proven that it is very effective. Allergic conjunctivitis, even in cases of atopic dermatitis, especially those associated with uh, allergic rhinitis and asthma. The most important probably would be stinging insect venom hypersensitivity, wasps, bees, and those insects which can cause an anaphylactic reaction and can actually kill a patient. So it's very effective for such patients. It also prevents the progression of allergic rhinitis to asthma and that is something which has been studied extensively in the ARIA, allergic rhinitis and its impact on asthma project of the WHO. Where is it indicated? It's indicated where symptoms are very severe. The cause is difficult to avoid, such as tree or grass pollens in a particular season where even after wearing masks and preventative measures, it doesn't help. Medication, where those are either causing side effects or are totally ineffective and in those patients who don't want to take medication for whatever reason. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, to prevent the progression of disease. What actually is allergen immunotherapy? It's basically giving a controlled dose of the substance which is causing the allergy, but in a purified manner and increasing the doses over a period of time. And once the symptoms are controlled, then maintaining it for weeks to months to years, actually. According to the WHO task force, probably I think 20 years back, 
or maybe 30 years ago, you maintain uh, for three to five years after symptoms have improved totally. So that's about allergy vaccination. How does it work? There are lots of um, theories about this. There are lots of mechanisms involved. And I've given you the reference, so anyone who's interested can actually go back and I'll state the references at the end again. And because it's not in the scope of this talk to talk about this. Now comes the main thing. What can you, as an allergist, practicing in Pakistan do, or as an immunologist, which nobody else can do? The most important thing is to identify your local allergens, especially those allergens which are inhaled, known as aeroallergens. These can include dust mites and other dust particles. Mites are ubiquitous throughout the world, but then we have specific types of dust related to our environment, to, uh, related to the sort of occupations we have, and I'll just talk about those in a minute. Different types of pollens. Pollen grains are different for each and every plant, and Pakistan has many plants which cause allergies but are not documented elsewhere in such large quantities, so they don't cause as much symptoms as they do in Pakistan. Fungi or mold, those are very important. Indoor allergens, food allergens. So we have lots of things which uh, we should be looking at from a local perspective. What do we do? Here at the Allergy and Asthma Institute of Pakistan, we have uh, installed Burkhardt pollen and spore samplers in different places in Islamabad, and we look at different pollens and spores throughout the year, uh, more as a research project than to um, disseminate the information because we're still standardizing our uh, results. As you can see, the, um, the Centaurus towers in the background. Um, the slides that you'll see will be um, like this, which come from uh, the Burkhardt sampler. The slide on the left, you can see the pink colored large glass pollens, the smaller paper mulberry pollens. Uh, the slide on the right shows you um, fungal spores which are airborne. Paper mulberry, which I just mentioned, paper mulberry trees are found in abundance in Islamabad and the levels are probably, the pollen levels, one of the highest recorded counts in the world. But more important than that is that these are very dangerous pollens and because they cause not only allergic rhinitis, asthma and have been documented to cause death as well. Um, cannabis, sativa, which is bhang. Um, the leaves are the intoxicating component, but the little pods which come after the flowers actually cause respiratory allergies throughout north of Pakistan, right down to Sakhar, and especially after the rainy season. Uh, Prosopis, this is your very own Karachi, which as you can see, the Kikri uh, Jhari that we have, when you come out of the airport, Shara Faisal used to be full of this. These particular photographs have been taken from behind the Karachi University before all the construction came on. And in the topmost um, image, you can see the little uh, florets, the little flowers, which actually give off pollens. And this is more abundant in Karachi in July, August, and probably September, and is causing respiratory allergy. Parthenium, this little thing also known as baby flower is used in bouquets. The leaves are very toxic and they cause blistering of the skin, but the Parthenium pollen also causes respiratory allergies. Um, this picture is from behind Rawal Dam in Islamabad. Wheat threshing, as I mentioned, in Pakistan we still use, most of the country uses the old type wheat threshers and not the harvesters. And wheat threshers produce dust which can go as far as 10 miles downwind. So villages who don't even know where the threshing is going on get affected and people start having respiratory symptoms. This is different times in different parts of the country. Uh, wheat threshing begins earlier in Sin and Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa, slightly later in Punjab, but also in Balochistan as well. If you look at ginning, this is something that we have, cotton ginning, rice, all those things, but cotton ginning you can see if you go to any chakki, which you, you may be going, especially there used to be chakkis in Sadar and other places, you can see this sort of dust and someone just standing there to even buy atta or something can actually get a coughing and wheezing attack. Rice husking, this picture is taken from outside Lahore um, when they used to have rice husking on the GT road. And the dust which comes out of these, of the husk coming is also very potent. Same thing happens. Uh, with women giving histories of history of 
having coughing, sneezing, and wheezing when they're cleaning rice. Indoor allergens, house dust mite, the commonest allergen throughout the world is also found throughout Pakistan. Then other allergens such as cockroaches, as you can see on the left, uh, German and American cockroaches, uh, insects, and if you close in on the photograph of the cat, you can see the little dander. Dander is the same in animals as dandruff is in, is in humans, just go, um, you know, so those sort of things are very strong allergens. Um, treating them or identifying the cause is very important in managing people with indoor pet allergies or indoor allergens. Allergies from fungi, we have a lot of humidity, we have a lot of leakage in, in our roofs and, and in our pipes, and then the wet walls, this black fungus is a spurgulous niger, or then you can see the green fungus, which is very common, even if you have bread lying around, um, it becomes green and green moldy. Alternaria can be seen, which is also a very strong and potent allergen. So coming back to your role again, but this is where I think the PSI can play the leading role of developing standards for various allergens throughout the country. This is again going to be a very great service for the nation. What do you do? You collect purified source material. There's many ways of doing that. Here, like we do for paper mulberry pollens, we connect, we collect the, the catkins, we put them at control temperature and humidity on um, sieves and uh, netting and allow the pollen to flow through and then we go gradient by gradient and eventually we end up with pollen like this. So what do you do for preparing an allergen extract? As you can see, you collect purified source material once you have that, then you make sure that it is properly cleaned. And after cleaning, the first step comes, that is defatting. The reason is pollens contain lipids and lipids are not water soluble. And you're gonna, and you're gonna have to make a water soluble or a liquid soluble um, extract, which can be used for therapy and for vaccinations and for testing. So you have to defat it. There are different defatting agents you can use, acetone, toluene, carbon tetrachloride, all mixtures of those. But it all depends on what allergen you're doing. Once that's done, then it has to be dried and make sure that all the fat has been removed and then homogenized, which is like putting it in a grinder and mixing it up to really fine particles. Now comes the extraction stage. People use some things as simple as normal saline to phosphate buffered saline. We use phosphate buffered saline with phenol as a preservative in it. And it all depends on what pH you want the extraction and that's where the pH of your buffer is going to lie. So basically extraction is nothing other than putting the homogenized um, extract uh, powder or whatever your substance allergen is into a solution and allowing, allowing all the, the allergens to seep into the solution. And then you filter it, clear it, and once it's been filtered, you can either centrifuge it if you have particles and you want fine particles, and you can do high-speed centrifugation, and the clear supernatant is what you're going to be using. Um, once you have that, then you go in for microfiltration. You can, depending on the particle size, start with a 0.8 micron filter, go to a 0.45, and then come down to a 0.22, and that should be good enough for most of your purification. At this stage, you may want to test for sterility so you can uh, culture it onto nutrient agar or blood agar or something just to see the growth of any contaminants that you have. If the pH of the solution that you've developed is too acid or too alkaline for you, then you may want to dialyze it through dialyzing tubing or dialyzing membrane, whisking tubing, whatever, to get the pH that you require. Once you've got all that done, then you aliquot it down to small um, portions, which you can either freeze or freeze dry. We don't have a facility for freeze drying and we're never very successful with that. So we just freeze them at minus 40 degrees till we need the portions. So that's a simple way of developing the, the allergens and the extracts. Once you've developed the extract, there are many, many ways of standardization. There are many steps in standardization, but what we are doing is using the, what is known as the ideal 50 method in which you look at the average, the skin prick test and use the extract as skin prick test, dilute it to the 
concentration which gives you a wheel and wheel size of both the diameter, the length and the breadth of 50 millimeters. So that's essentially the ideal. Once you have your, <coughs> excuse me, once you have your extract ready, now comes the difficult part. You have to regist register it with the Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan. The draft requires, has some very stringent requirements and even though preparation of allergens is a totally different world from pharmaceutical preparation, they um, still require that all the formalities of a pharmaceutical um, license should be fulfilled for a, a, a biological um, allergen extract license, which includes having a plot size of 2,000 square yards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's probably easier to import the allergens that you want if they're available um, outside of Pakistan, especially if they're registered with FDA, FDA standardized or European standards, then that license can be valid here at DHA as well, at the drafts as well. Now comes once you have your purified allergen, what's going to be your next step? So you have to have a very careful patient history so that you know what you're going to test is, is relevant to the patient. So if your patient is living in, in for example, in Hyderabad or in Karachi or in Sakkar, and you're going to test him for paper mulberry, which is only in Islamabad or in Atak or Peshawar or those places, even if the test comes positive, he's sensitized, it has no clinical value because it's not in his environment. Conversely, Sometimes people will test negative, but their, the season of their symptoms and their location is very important. For example, we know that paper mulberry pollens start shedding in the first week of March till the second or third week of April in Islamabad, for example. It's also in other places. So you have a patient who has symptoms in Islamabad from the first week of March to the third week of April, but even if he's not um, having an allergy test, you would think that it's quite possible that he may be a negative responder. So anyway, the, you have to know the environment, places where people work, what they do. Um, there was a time when people used to live in, in uh, PCHS phase two, but when they'd go to Dalmia factory, because the Dalmia cement factory used to pump out loads of that cement dust and the fine particulate dust would aggravate. That was not allergy. I mean, that's that causes sensitization still. So you have to know where the person lives, where he works, where he studies, you know, many things like that. So that's where the occupation comes in. The presence of pets, the presence of other triggers. You have to have a good history to know what you're going to test. And then when the test comes out positive, you can know whether that was significant or not. What do you do in this test? All you have to do is simply take a drop of the extract Prick it with a fine needle and then watch for a wheel and flare and then just measure it. Because Professor Gordons is going to talk about other diagnostic um, parameters for allergic diseases, I'm not going to touch upon those now. So once you've got the proper history, once you've got your allergens which match the history, the season, the timing, everything, now you know this patient is an ideal candidate for, excuse me, immunotherapy. Where do you start with the immunotherapy? There's different types of, of um, committees which have decided on different ways of doing immunotherapy. The Europeans prefer to do a single antigen, maximum two or at the most three allergens in one extract. The Americans are more liberal and they go for as many as 10 extracts per uh, allergen extract. So if a person is allergic to maybe dust mites and to maybe um, a certain pollen and something else, or three, four types of pollens, they'll mix those together in one bottle. What you have to make sure is when you're mixing, make sure you don't have any um, extract, in, uh, any uh, allergen which has proteolytic activity, especially molds. Molds have a lot of proteins, uh, proteolytic enzymes, which can um, break down the proteins of pollens. So you don't mix pollens and molds in one bottle, they have to be in separate. So small things like this, and you should know about um, cross reactivity. For example, if you tested 15 types of grasses and they all came out positive, you're not gonna treat 15 types of grasses. You have to know which was the main grass and which ones are cross reacting with it. So 
These are small things, and we've talked about these when we did our workshops earlier on allergy skin testing. So <clears throat> basically, what you're going to do when a patient comes to you, look at his symptoms, see if the symptoms correlate with the, uh, with the aeroallergen, confirm it with a skin prick test, or maybe if that's not possible with a specific IgE, uh, try pharmaceutical treatment and avoidance measures. If avoidant me avoidance measures and medicines don't work, then discuss it with the patient, and he is going to be your ideal candidate for allergen immunotherapy. Here's the list of references, and I'm just going to share my email address with you after this, and you are more than welcome to write to me, message me, email me uh, for any sort of assistance that I can give. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really sorry again that I'm not there with you, but thank you for your time and for your listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Swan. Now the forum is open for the question answers. Okay. Dr. Rabia would like to ask. Thank you, Dr. Swan, for a very nice talk. My question is, that uh, how do you monitor the efficacy of your immunotherapy?
हेलो
Hello, excuse me. Hello, everyone. May I request uh, respected chairs to please conclude the session. Uh, uh, today's like, uh, session was very uh, interesting, uh, especially the invited talks uh, given by uh, Shahzad, Dr. Shahzad and uh, Dr. Farina. And Dr. Shahzad rightfully indicated and identified the uh, role of uh, uh, specific antibodies which help in the spontaneous uh, clearance of uh, hepatitis C infection and uh, we are the region where we have a very high burden of uh, hepatitis C viral disease. So uh, this must be a baseline uh, for the uh, one step forward for the production of vaccine uh, to cure the hepatitis C virus and the second lecture was about the uh, use of natural killer cells in acute myel uh, myeloid uh, le leukemia. And that is also uh, set the uh, foundation uh, for the uh, initiation of a uh, very uh, uh, era in which the immunotherapy is no more a dream and we can use immunotherapy for, to cure the certain diseases. The all, uh, the all four uh, uh, free papers was excellent in their um, uh, contest and uh, especially the one which was uh, focused on the preparation of in-house uh, HEP2 cell slides for the uh, ANA testing. That was very interesting. If we can have uh, tho uh, those uh, systems working in the immunology lab, so we can definitely save the cost of the uh, case that we procure outside of the Pakistan. And uh, the uh, lectures on immunity and the long-last immunity after uh, nine months or all that relative things uh, and Dr. Rabia rightfully asked the significance of titers after six and nine months if they are, they are, there was a very minute difference uh, uh, among the titers. So uh, it was a very uh, vibrant uh, session that we had and I am thankful and grateful uh, for the organizers especially Dr. Sabia, Dr. Sabahat and all that to uh, providing me m uh, this opportunity to chair this session and all the speakers uh, did very excellent job. Thank you. I conclude the session. Dr. Uh, Talat, you have to say a few words? Uh, it was, uh, I will second Dr. Salma. It was uh, really an excellent session by all the presenters. So I will ask Dr. Sabaha to proceed ahead. I'm extremely thankful to our uh, uh, distinguished chairs who actively participated and make the session successful. I'm also thankful to the invited speakers and free paper presenters who actively participated. Uh, now may I request Professor Rabia for the distribution of uh, she to the chairs and uh, invited speaker. Um, Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, the, our, our respected chairs, Dr. Salma Bhutun, please. Next chair of this session, Dr. Talat Rumi. Uh, Dr. Farina Bilmani for her invited talk. And last is uh, mine for moderating the session. <laughs> Now we are going to 
proceed with the award uh, giving ceremonies to our oral and poster presenters. So the PAP gave uh, for one for here, you have to So one for oral presenter and three for poster presenter. But we have arranged uh, two more for the oral presentations as well. So we have now three for orals and three for poster over here. And then there is one will be uh, for the gold, uh, Bukhari gold uh, medal. So that uh, we have given the name to the PAP organizers and then they are going to announce in the closing ceremony. So th that is the secret, who is the gold winner. So now I'm going to announce uh, the third prize. Pehle bata third the third uh, oral presentation goes to Kumail Ahmed from Aga Khan University. Uh, Kumail is not here, so on his behalf, maybe I can uh, collect his oral. Now the second uh, oral prize goes to Maria Mashfaq from Indus Hospital. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so on he, on her behalf, Arid may may collect. Yeah. The shield is not. Okay. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. And, uh, and the first prize goes to Asma Khan from DUHS. <laughs> No, nobody is here. Yeah, supervisors are receiving awards. Super, super supervisors. Okay. That's very sad. Thank you so much. Okay. Now we come to the poster uh, awards. So the, uh -huh. so to, there are two uh, uh, poster awards that are sharing between two uh, individuals. Yeah. So okay. So Tayyab Aziz from Indus uh, Hospital. Third. So they are sharing third and second because they have uh, scored same percentage, seventy-six point two five. So Tayyab Aziz from Indus Hospital. <laughs> Finally, Finally somebody. somebody. <laughs> and Farhana Shahzad from UHS. Uh, UHS Lahore. Farhana? 
فرحانہ شہزاد یو ایچ ایس کا ہے یہاں پر کوئی ڈاکٹر فہیم نہیں اچھا آئی تھنک ہی لیفٹ اوکے اوکے اینڈ سباحت عزیز فرام ڈی یو ایچ ایس فار دا فرسٹ پوسٹر پرائز اوکے ہاں ہاں نہیں تو پھر سیکنڈ کو ملے گا تھینک یو ڈاکٹر آبیا فار فہیم تو ابھی تھے دیکھو جو ہے بس ان کا کر دو Then you have Talat Mehjabeen nahi hai and Kiran. Sara. Dr. Shahid Abbas. Sorry, Fatma Kanani or Hussain.
Okay. Um, Assalamu alaikum. If I may have your attention, please. Uh, we have the certificates and the shields for PSI uh, lifetime membership. And um, we have a very few of us here. So the ones who are present, we'll be distributing the shields to them. I would request Dr. Sabat Sarfraz to come and take a shield. Um, I request Dr. Talat Rumi to please come and take a Dr. Bajia Musharraf for her lifetime membership. Hazaro Sal Jyotum PSI. Dr. Zain, can you uh, take the shields of Dr. Sara and Dr. Mohammed Hussain and can you have it delivered to them? Dr. Mohammed Hussain? Yes. Sara, okay. Okay, okay. That's fine. So, Dr. Mohammed Hussain, ki shield we are going to give to you. Anyone from NIBD here? No one. Kisko? No, no. Actually, we uh, have made a lifetime membership award for Dr. Tahir Shamsi. Uh, but uh, I think there is no one here from NIBD, so we'll give him. Uh, I think I'll I'll take. I'll take Dr. Tahir Shamsi's award and I'll give it to So the other uh, PSI members um, uh, who have been the, uh, have taken the lifetime membership include uh, Dr. Fahim Shahzad, uh, Dr. Uh, Mehjabin Imam. Dr. Mehjabin Imam is in Lahore, so we'll have it delivered to her. Uh, Dr. Kiran Iqbal, uh, Dr. Sara Waqar, Dr. Shahid Abbas. Uh, yes, Kiran uh, Iqbal. Uh, and Dr. Fatma Kirani. Fatma Kirani ki I can take. Kiran ki yari mere baat.
क्या बोल रही लड़की माजी आ गई हो क्या ये तू है सेकंड पोस्टर ओके वन मिनट वन मिनट और और फातिमा की नानी मैं ले लूँगी बाद में बस ऐसे दे दो छोड़ दो रहने दो अच्छा डॉक्टर राबिया बिकॉज दैट टीम टू द लाहौर दे हैव लेफ्ट आई थिंक सो वी आर गिविंग द सेकंड पोस्टर अवार्ड टू अनदर नेक्स्ट कैंडिडेट दैट इज माजिया पता होता तो मैं सेकंड अपने बंदे को दिलवा दी थर्ड को दिलवा दी ओके नाउ विल स्टार्ट आवर एजीएम विल बी स्टार्ट एजीएम सो So it's really very sorry to see that most of our PSI members they have to leave because of the some some fly, uh, flight issues. So I'm just going to go uh, through all of it uh, uh, briefly. आपका एजेंडा खुला मेरा यहाँ पे आया एजेंडा if you can just project it. खुला है Uh, so the t uh, so today's um, agenda um, uh, i'll uh, i have already distributed minutes of the last meeting i think you have all uh, all gone through it so i'll be uh, requiring approval for that then i'll present general secretary report finance secretary report will be, uh, will be presented by uh, dr bajiha then uh, we have already distributed the psi shields and then of course uh, this will uh, the the new council will be introduced uh, so uh, the minutes uh, up agenda ho gaya minutes laga de iske upar jo dusra wala tha na minutes wala laga de isko record mein rakh dal please iski koi minutes record kar le please ye sare hat gaya na wo wala dusra kar do maine aapko log okay so uh, the agent uh, so this this were the minutes um, of the last meeting we had the agenda of uh, the meeting was held on the 24th august 2022 and the agenda was election and then uh, uh, joint conference of pathology society uh, that was the agenda ius meeting and other any other business so the members who attended uh, it was uh, on the zoom so the members who attended and who uh, could uh, Uh, send the regrets and who did not attend uh, and did not uh, even send the regrets the names are all over here and then uh, uh, the discussion was okay okay so um, in that uh, meeting uh, dr rana muzaffar uh, basically uh, she Uh, volunteer to be the election commission then we had the election uh, in the same year and then now we have the uh, next council that we uh, i mean uh, we all know who is the next council but i am going to give you the names uh, so the that thing was closed and then the points to be discussed uh, so all of these points are already closed so just move on uh okay so uh, the points that were discussed at that time were all closed by now the only point that remained was the akhir mein lo akhir mein dusra page likh lo the iois meeting which is going to happen in 2023 in november so now the next council uh, need to work on this uh, meeting uh, uh, we, we should be we should have a good representation from the psi in that meeting so now it's the work of the new council to 
uh, ask for the abstracts, then we should be evaluated. Uh, and b with a senior committee, uh, we have made that committee also, Dr. Rabia Hussain, Dr. Brigitte Tahir Aziz and all that, uh, uh, before sending the abstracts to the IUS from the PS PSI platform. Uh, next meeting uh, for the PAP uh, and joint co um, conference of the societies have also been announced uh, to be held, I think, in November, because they haven't given the name at that time, but it will be in November uh, in Lahore next year. I hope that two meetings do not coincide, otherwise it will be uh, very bad. We'll have to work on that. Yes. So please uh, note down this in the meetings that uh, the next council have to sort out uh, uh, for the funding uh, uh, of the IOS, going to IOS. Right? Okay. So, uh, uh, sorry, I did not ask. Uh, the minutes of, of the last meeting, I, can I have the approval for that or this approval? Approved. approved. Okay, unanimously approved. Please note it down. Thank you. Uh, so, this is the report uh, of uh, my last AGM report. Please, Agi uh, So, uh, in, in 2022, we have 53 members now with uh, life members 34, regular members 2, and associate members 17. So, this is the timeline of our PSI membership. You can see that in 2011, we started with 7 members, increased to 10, and then gradually, uh, we, have, we are now 53 members. And uh, the lifetime membership has also uh, uh, grown uh, gradually. And, um, from 7, 10, and then now we have 32 life, uh, life members. Uh, most of these members, initially they were associate members because most of them were the students, PhD students or residents. Now they are, they are the full-fledged uh, immunologists or the PhD immunologists. So they have converted their, the, their membership into life membership. This is very encouraging. Um, so th this is some highlights. Um, We, had, uh, we registered our uh, society in 2013, and then uh, the website was uh, uh, developed by Dr. Mayer. This is the la latest website picture. Uh, our newsletter is also uh, posted, uploaded on that. Uh, bank account was opened in uh, August 2014, and uh, we, were also, we also got the accreditation from the PMDC for CME activities, but then we were not able to work uh, much more on that. We had uh, CME activities after that, few semi CME activities. <clears throat> this is the, just the highlights. In 2011, we started uh, uh, and we had the first PAP and PA conference over here and the, in which the immunology sessions were uh, uh, held in that conference for the first time. Then in 2012, first joint conferences was held in Raul Pindi. Then 2013, we had in Lahore. Uh, uh, then uh, after we got the registration, uh, uh, society registered, we had uh, the first kickoff uh, 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 seminar uh, on allergies, it was very successful, held in uh, April 2014, and then in 2015 we have two CME activities. Uh, one was uh, uh, led by Dr. Talat Rumi at the UHS, and another was led by Dr. Salma at SIUT. Uh, these are uh, more, some more highlights. In December 2015 we had the annual conference, then in Lahore, then in 2016 we had in Peshawar, then in 2017 uh, we had at uh, SIUT. Uh, 2018, again, we had at Rawalpindi, and 2019 was in Quetta, and that was actually coincided with IOIS meeting, and three of us, the PSI members, went to IOIS, and uh, during that time, uh, Dr. Mejabin uh, took hold of the meeting and did organize very well all, the, all of those uh, events. So uh, then the COVID came, you know, and we were all got stuck and then during that time we had uh, one webinar, very good webinar, three days web webinar and we had uh, many international and national speakers in that. Uh, so Jate um, Jate I have uh, with the help of Professor Dr. Rabia Hussain, we have made our first e-newsletter and uh, we have circulated that in the, in the group also and we have some print copies. Uh, if you do not have not received, please take it from Dr. Sabat. Uh, the upcoming events, as I told you, that IUI's 2023 Congress are here, 27th November to 2nd December, is announced, and, and from Jan January 2023, the abstract submission will be open. 
uh, and then the next will uh, next forty uh, fourth annual conference or ninth joint conference of the societies will be uh, at uh, at uh, PC Hotel uh, Lahore. Um, so lastly, I really want to give a tribute to Dr. Tahi Shamsi. He uh, became a lifetime member in 2019, and he was very actively involved in PSI. I think, in fact, in the uh, for the webinar also, he was instrumental uh, for us to make it happen. And then uh, for the financial uh, issues or funding of the PSI, he he was actually uh, trying to help us out. And the one meeting I remember uh, we held for this financial, uh, to discuss this financial issues. And I messaged him, Dr. Tahir, will you be there? Yes, you just email me, I'll be there. And then the next day I heard that he's in the hospital. But I didn't take it seriously. I thought that he'll come back, but then, you know, after a few days. So um, we had elections in October. The new council has been uh, declared by Dr. Rana Muzaffar. So I congratulate this new council and Wish them all the best. Thank you. Are you going to introduce the new council members? Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 the new council members, President is Colonel Daud uh, from AFIP. Uh, then the secretary is, no, he's not here. Uh, Colonel uh, Umer is just here because uh, he, has, he has the flight. He had the flight. He's the secretary. And then uh, we have the vice, pres vice president, uh, Dr. Khabar, he's also not here. And then we have the finance secretary, at least she's here. <laughs> so she's representing the whole council. Please come here. <laughs> yes, <I'm> here. <laughs> she's the finance secretary and... Uh, uh, Maybe we should think of having the council meetings earlier. Mm -hmm. Yes, if it's not possible. Please help us in funding. Yes. <laughs> Now she's the main person now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So please note our formation. <laughs> okay. So can I have the approval for this uh, um, AGM report? Okay. Thank you very much. How often is the newsletter going to come out? Uh, no, this is uh, the depend on the new, new council. Now we have the ability, now do it on Zoom. Yes, because initially it was not possible. Now we have Zoom, yes, we can. Yeah, you have to decide along with your PSL farm. Why don't you send out a flyer of schedule of meeting and then people can see about their availability and get back to you. Yeah, I think you can give two or three days of work back. Yeah, you can have their choice. Samaat, you don't have any idea. Okay, pass me so again. I'm that little. Don't you have a picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't you have a picture? 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 Yeah, yeah.
the finance report i really cannot tell you much because ab tak maine nahi dekha tha the whole uh, amount i had uh, we had in the opening balance at the beginning of uh, july 2018 was uh, uh, 3 lakhs 5000 and 152 rupees and they have been some expenditures and um, we have also had um, uh, psi members but the closing balance at 30 june 2022 was 188120 so we need to find more resources yeah yeah because there have been certain expenditures i can see that in the bank statement but i really don't know how that has happened yeah no no there hasn't been any revenue only the memberships uh, yeah and they have been expenditures of like and this was also because you had राइट
connection, you know, it's not an easy job. I, so I think we need to I have to get the relationship with